So I want to talk about contradictions in the Bible. And today, I, instead of looking at a specific contradiction, I want to look at the idea of contradictions in the Bible. Um, whenever you're talking about contradictions, people instantly come up with their own ideas of what that means. And then because in more recent years, people just aren't great with um, actually communicating and entering into dialogue, everybody just kind of believes what they all already want to believe, and then any time that somebody else believes something else, they're stupid. You know, you see this happen a lot with uh, with social media. Um, you know, uh, hey, you need to be tolerant. Well, I don't think I need to be tolerant. Oh, I'm not going to tolerate you. But that makes that makes you intolerant. See what I mean? There's a lot of a lot of things where you know you can have a, an opinion about anything so long as it doesn't disagree with my opinion, and that's just not a healthy place to be in. And so I kind of really want to just spend this video talking about that. Um, and for that, it, it's worth mentioning that there's a lot of people, especially um, on YouTube comment sections and Facebook and stuff, where they're just kind of hellbent on believing the wrong thing. It, it doesn't really necessarily matter, um, matter what it is. They're just like, this is what I'm going to believe, and I don't even... I don't even care. Like here, here's an example. Um, okay, I'm I'm really into history. I love history, and I was teaching one time, and one person had a in the class that I was teaching had. I'm kind of trying to be. I'm trying to be very vague. They had a very wrong idea of something um, historical, and so I tried to correct it in the middle of the lesson, which obviously was a little bit of a detour for those people who were in there, but. Um, you know, I, I, I tried to, you know, correct what they were saying, and no, 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 that, that's not true. And it's like, well, how, I, I actually do know what I'm talking about, about I, this is what I study about, I, I know very much what I'm talking about here. And, you know, then they continued to say, no, no, that's not how it was, even though they had no idea about history, they had no idea about what they were talking about, but because they read something online that affirmed something that they thought was interesting, without checking whether it's historical, they just latched on to it as that is true, and so then they kept going on with it. That's just an example. Um, some people, they, they, they believe something for whatever reason, and they're just hell-bent on believing that. Um, in a recent, uh, in, a, in a different situation, I was involved with the um, argument, if you want to call it that. Whenever it's online, it's hard to call it an argument, because basically it's just who can type a response fastest and nobody reads the comments they just they just shoot out you know zippers and try to make fun of people as, as fast as they can so it's not really a conversation but let's just say let's just say let's just say it's an argument um, and they were um, misquoting something that I said and so I said well okay well this kind of answers that and they said well now that's not fair because you're saying that all these things you're you you've created a, a, a nice little excuse for every single one of the things that you said, and I said it's not it's I'm not creating an excuse for this. It's these are the actual facts. You have been mis um, you've been taking the facts out of context this whole time, and I didn't say hey that's not fair that that, that you're not um, that you're misquoting the facts. I just corrected the facts and I showed you proof and I showed I showed research to back up what I was saying. And still, the argument. Here's another example. This time it's on Facebook. And I made a comment about um, what research has shown with um, uh, a link with, with depression in women um, and something that was going on there. And they said, I don't believe that. So I gave the research, somebody else's professional peer-reviewed research, and they, they still didn't believe it. So I was like, well, what do you want me to do with that? You know what I mean? If I give facts, if I give give you know research to back up what I'm saying and you still don't believe it that's not my fault that that means that you're just simply being pig-headed so you know there, there's always this conversation where you have to come to grips am I just being hellbent on believing the wrong thing hey that's not fair you're making it make sense it has to make not make sense because I said that it doesn't have to make sense and that's a lot of times what happens with contradictions is there's contradictions in the Bible because I believe that there's contradictions in the Bible, therefore this has to be a contradiction. Well, actually, if you just explain, you know, then I explain something. Oh, well, no, you can't be right because then it makes sense and that's not fair. 
So that takes us to the idea of skepticism. Skepticism oftentimes is ridiculed by religious people, and, it, and I think that's kind of unfair. Skepticism is a good thing, and, and for a lot, for a large point, there's there's a good level of skepticism. Like, did this really happen? That's something worth worth questioning, you know, especially when you're talking about eternal things. Did this really happen? You know, th that's good. But there comes a point when when skepticism gets to a very unhealthy place, when it goes to extremism, when no answer will be good enough, excuse me, when no answer will be good enough and they've already decided what to believe, no amount of research will, will, will persuade them, this is what they have chosen to believe. And they hold to standards that can't possibly exist. For instance, I won't believe that Jesus was a real person who then died and was raised back to life unless I personally see it. Well, you don't have a time machine. How could you possibly see it? So I mean, it, when, when you're when you're expecting proof that cannot possibly exist, that's 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 just ridiculous. It it's not healthy skepticism. It's just this extremism that you can't do anything with. And the thing about extremism is usually people who are extremists are one-sided extremists. You have to give all kinds of proof and validation that can't possibly exist as far as for why your beliefs, they should believe your beliefs. But then when it comes to their beliefs, they take it up on a whim. You know, like for instance, I, I always use the example of evolution. Or aliens. I mean, either example is fine. Um, let's use uh, aliens first. A lot of people believe in aliens when we have found no evidence of aliens. Evolution. I personally believe in evolution. I know a lot of Christians don't. I know there's a lot of people who think that there's a problem. I don't personally see a problem, but whatever. Uh, however, I'm not hell-bent on it. I I'm willing to say, okay, maybe evolution didn't happen. You know, if somebody were to adequately persuade me. But with that being said... Evolution has a lot of problems with it as a theory, um, and there's a lot of times that people don't even do their due diligence. They basically just say, since we know that evolution is a fact, I can just assume that this is how that happened. And it's like, well, no, just because evolution is the commonly held belief does not mean that, first off, that everything absolutely happened by evolution. Maybe there's something that we're, that we're overlooking, or B, that evolution even is real. Maybe we're just misinterpreting. Uh, the evidence. So these are just examples of what I'm talking about. And so then you kind of get into this place where people will just go and dislike videos without thought, without considering what's going on, being said in the video, simply because they're irritated. They're irritated because the person on the video is saying something they don't agree with. It doesn't matter if they're wrong or if they're right. It doesn't matter. They're just irritated, or maybe they're just being hateful or whatever. But the, there's that, you know. And you see a lot of people say, well, you know, um, morals morals are pretty relative. And then they go and make fun of Christians and stuff on, on, on YouTube comments. So evidently, making fun of people with different opinions is okay. So I mean, you just have a lot of different moral loopholes. Now, I do want to bring um, bring kind of focus to a book called um, the I think I think I believe it's called the Big Book of Bible Difficulties, but it's by Norman Geiser, and um, he died I want to say two years back. Um, just a, a phenomenal um, theologian. Uh, check out that book. Um, I'm pretty sure the book is called Big Book of Bible Difficulties, but if it's not, just look up Norman Geisler's, um, uh, whatever you call it, bibliography or whatever, the books that he wrote, um, and I'm sure you'll be able to find it. So uh, in the late 1800s, a man named J.W. Haley uh, gave eight reasons that contradictions are, are typically seen. Um, he, d he believed that the Bible did not have contradictions, but there were eight reasons why other people thought they saw contradictions. First off, a failure to read what it, act what it says, what it really says. Sometimes people say, well, doesn't the Bible say this? Or they'll read, just kind of briefly read it and not really read it, you know what I mean? Like when you're talking to somebody and you can tell that they ha aren't actually listening to what you're saying, they just kind of picked something that they thought that, that they liked and said they can make fun of you for it when they didn't actually hear what you said. Um, kind of like that, but with the Bible. Um, okay, so that's that's the first one. Saying off false interpretations. Um, not every interpretation is accurate. Um, even the most literal word-for-word -word translations are not always 100% accurate. There is no such thing as two um, languages that have perfect um, perfect uh, connect that that they that they are perfectly aligned. That just doesn't happen. 
different cultures think differently. They have different words to describe different thought processes. Some some are more literal, some are, some are more metaphorical. Some just view the world differently. See, now we live in a, in a scientific age, and people think, take things overly literal all the time. And so we have a hard time understanding that anybody else can think any way else. Our way surely is the right way of thinking because we're the ones thinking it. Everybody always thinks that. So with that being said, some interpretations are just not as accurate. So th with Bibles, there, there's two basic ideas, the word for word and thought for thought. Word for word is where they try to get the idea of what's being said in a way that's easy to underst understand, like the New Living Translation or the message. But then there's some that try to be as literal as possible. But there's problems with that because idioms and, and, and analogies and stuff that don't quite translate well. So you kind of have to say thing, some things that are might be misunderstood or might be above people's heads or something. And so you try and, and weed through these different differences in your translation, and that's why it's important that pastors should probably um, learn the languages themselves rather than just reading the Bible, but that's neither here nor there. Um, either way, there's some false interpretations, and a lot of times you'll you'll see people um, using um, quoting the King James Version to uh, prove that they are right and that the Bible is, has contradictions. When the King James was from the 1600s, I, I would hardly say that that's accurate. Words have changed. Even if it was perfectly accurate, the words that were used back then have changed. Um, okay. Um, another uh, third reason: having a wrong idea of the Bible. For instance, um, the Bible accurately records Satan's words. That doesn't mean that everything that Satan says in the Bible is true. That doesn't mean that, see what I mean? There's sometimes people just have a wrong idea of the, about the Bible itself, and then they assume that the Bible has to meet that standard. Um, you see this happen a lot of times with, with people who are oblivious as to how history works and, and how historical documents were written, and then they just come to the Bible and say, it has to be written like a modern, like a modern book. And it has to be written from my perspective, um, and it has to completely, perfectly accent my language, and my culture, and that's just that's just not the way the Bible works. And honestly, that's the fact with any ancient book. It doesn't matter, matter if we're talking about you know um, <laughs> if we're talking about Greek writings like you know the Iliad or something like that, or if we're talking about any other number of things, the Egypt text or Babylonians law codes or anything. It, you have to take into account culture. That's just something that, that that just has to happen. I was reading a book by uh, Jonathan Tubb about the Canaanites, and he made some sweeping statements about the origin of Yahweh, about when the Bible was written, and how the Bible uh, is just like other documents without even necessarily addressing it, just making assumptions about the things. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I found that kind of alarming because he's actually a historian. And then he made these very unhistorical claims, and uh, it's actually fairly common, though, but I'm getting off topic. So then the fourth thing, some ac accounts are condensed in the Bible. Um, some don't have every single detail. Um, the, an example of this would be when Jesus uh, came back, you know, uh, came back from the dead, excuse me, and some women came to his tomb. Well, in one account, it only says that one woman was there. It doesn't say that no other woman joined her, or that, that she, you know, it doesn't say that there were no other women. It just said that there was one there at that time. And uh, so then people say, ha, ah, the other one says that there were a couple women, so therefore it's a contradiction. No, it's, it, it's not. Just because an account is condensed or so on and so forth, you get know what I'm saying. Number five. Um, then there is uh, chronological difficulties. Now, some people think that since they don't understand something, that therefore it must not be true. Um, one of the big things that uh, comes up is um, the books of Kings and Chronicles, the datings of the kings and, and that kind of stuff. And people say, well, the dating is wrong. Well, it is wrong if you don't, don't understand what's going on. Um, first off, there's the problems that we're currently having with, with Egyptian history. So there's that big problem, which is way too big to get into today. But then there's the problem with, um, with Israel and Judah themselves. You see, at different times, they used different calendars that started on different times of the year. That some of them included what was called um, a renal year, and some, some of them didn't. So what that means is that some kings um, 
let me just make this really easy. Some kings say that they reigned for thir 13 years when it was actually 14 years, or 14 years when it was actually 13 years, vice versa. Now, if you want to know more about that, um, there's actually a whole book on it by Edwin Thiel. It's called um, the mysterious numbers of uh, the mysterious numbers of the Hebrew kings. That's what it's called, and uh, you can read more more in there. I wouldn't agree with all of his um, conclusions, um, but I mean, either way, it's too valuable of an asset to just ignore. Um, anyways, and so misunderstanding something doesn't mean that it's not true. It means that you misunderstand it. Um, another another pro problem that people um, run into that, that makes them think that there's a contradiction, number six here, assuming all numbers are literal. If you read through numbers, for instance, you'll find a whole bunch of numbers that end with zero. That should make people stop and think, why are all these numbers ending in zero? What are the chances? What are the chances? And then there's the issue that there's only one number in all of the book of numbers that is has a precise to it and it doesn't end in zero and people just kind of overlook that so once again some numbers are literal and some are rounded you really can't be that surprised about this um, I mean you look at the Gospel of Matthew where um, Matthew says that there's 14 generations from here to here, 14 from here to here, 14 from here to here. Well, actually, there aren't 14 from here to there. He knew that, and his audience knew that. So the question become, becomes, why did he take people's names out and put other people's names in where they didn't go to make it 14? What was his reason here? See, rather than asking those questions of, of this is hard to understand, people just blow by it and say, okay, if the Bible is God's word, it has to meet my criteria, or criteria, um, and that's what will make it God's word. Well, so every couple of hundred years when people advance, you want them to the, the Bible to be re-given by God in a way that matches new standards. The seventh thing, copyist errors. Anytime you have massive amounts of copies of any manuscript, it, that's going to happen. Um, I mean, if you just take yourself and have somebody read a book to you and you write down what they're saying, even one chapter, heck, one page of one book, and write it down, and then have them read it again and you write it down again, and compare all three of those and see if they all are the same. Same punctuation, same... Now, with that being said, yes, okay. We have so many, excuse me, so many manuscript copies, though, that we can see where the errors are. Mm -hmm. And we can say with nine, between 97 and 99% certainty what the originals actually said. Now, that's kind of a big deal, and I feel like this is kind of blown over, but we're talking about a book that is thousands of years old that is very well attested. Most of the time, we're, we're finding, you know, broken tablets in, out in the desert, and we're saying, hey, look, we've got three lines with no breaks in them. Thank God, you know, and then we have the Bible, which has thousands of manuscripts, and we're actually saying that this is not accurate. I mean, that just doesn't, that, that doesn't fit. That doesn't fit. Saying that there's difficulties is not saying that the difficulties are insurmountable. And then this eighth thing, the last thing to mention here, mis mis misunderstanding the ancient language itself. That happens in transla translations all the time. You know, even in modern translations, they, are, they should be accurate so far as we currently understand the language it was um, it was translated from, you always have to go back to the original anytime you're done with the translation. That's just how that works. You can't take one person's translation as as gospel truth. It just that just can't work. Just a few things to consider. First off, people's personalities are very real in the Bible. God did not make people write down things uh, in His mood. Does that make sense? Um, you can, if you know the original languages, you can read them and say, oh, okay, I, like for instance, here, here's just a good example, um, the writings of Paul. If you've done a lot of translating with, with Paul's letters, you can see when something is not Paul. And it's kind of like um, if you read a novel by someone, um, let's say Stephen King, 
and you read you read his books. I mean, he's been writing just a crap ton of books. So then you go and read somebody else. You can tell that they're not written by the same hand. It's the same kind of idea. The Bible was written by people. Now, the problem is people who believe in the Bible, they kind of um, take this and they take it way out of context. And they say, okay, so since I believe that the Bible is God's word, that means it has to be dictated that God himself had to write down every single word that appears in my translation. There's just so much wrong with that. I, I don't even have time to say why that's retarded, but hopefully you have brains enough to figure it out yourself. Um, it, the Bible accurately reflects the intention of God. Absolutely. But the problem is here that a lot of times people can't get beyond the theory itself of what does it mean that the Bible is God's word. So they reduce it to nothing more than theory, and they're unable to see the bigger picture. So I would highly recommend you actually reading the Bible itself, and when you come to, to a hard part, taking that theory and then applying it to that hard part and seeing what happens, rather than just talking about the theoretics of it. Theoretically, I don't believe that the Bible could be written by God. Why? Well, because of this, this, and this. Well, if you pay attention to this, this, and this. See what I mean? So anyways, um, another problem that people have is they oftentimes confuse dictation with inspiration. Dictation says that every single word God dictated. Okay, like robots. Inspiration says that God inspired the people what to write. So in some cases, God said, say this, and then they wrote that. Other times, he gave dreams, and then they explained the dreams in the best way that they could. Other times, he did something, and so they recorded what had happened. God didn't. God did not speak. They just recorded what he did. Okay, let me give you a good example of this. Um, Joshua. Israel, this tiny, insignificant nation, going against these well-established, although not unified, Canaanite kings, and our chieftains, if you really want to get technical, and, you know, going in there and conquering and having the victory. Now, that's the bare fact of what happened. But then, there's other things to take into account. Israel was convinced that it was God's doing that, con that brought the victory. And it was God's doing that brought their defeat against AI. So then the question becomes, why did they think that? Is there anything to validate that view? Um, is there? So I mean, we should be asking questions about those kinds of things. Yes, absolutely. But that doesn't mean that God dictated how Israel recorded what God did. Now think about this. Read through the Bible and notice how many times it says, God said this, and then how many times it said, this is what happened. Think about that. Now think about perspectives that are going on. And then if you actually just stop and just think about it, rather than instantly coming to the conclusion, hey, the Bible is wrong because I said that there's contradictions, therefore there has to be contradictions, you'll be a lot better off. Um, the last thing here on this thing, um, there's a difference between you being wrong and you not agreeing. Okay, you're gonna watch a video, you're gonna you're gonna instantly decide that either you like it or you don't like it. Just because you don't like it doesn't mean that it's wrong. It also doesn't necessarily mean that you're wrong either. However, there is such a thing as not agreeing with something for no reason. You watch a video. Uh, about Christians saying that morals would not exist without God, and then you don't agree. Why don't you disagree? I mean, I'm sorry, why don't you agree? For a lot of people, it's, I don't agree because that's just stupid. Why is it stupid? Explain. Work through it. Clarify. Sometimes people believe something not because they actually believe it, but just because they're told to believe it or they think that they believe it. There's a world of difference there. I mean, a lot of people think that they're Christians, but then they don't act like a Christian. They don't serve people. They go to church every Sunday, and they think that that makes them a Christian, and it doesn't. So um, some more considerations. Not everything in the Bible was spoken by God. I already said this. God never said that the sun revolved around the earth, for instance. Um, not everything that people said in the Bible, God gave his stamp of approval on. So for instance, in Job, some of the things that Job or his friends said may or may not have been true, whereas the things that God said were always true. And the Bible accurately recorded the things that were not true. I hope that that makes sense. 
God, uh, the second point there, God did not expect them to have full knowledge of the universe before he spoke, even as he still doesn't. Do you honestly think that we have full knowledge of everything? Do you honestly think that we understand all the mysteries of the universe? Should God have waited all this time to have given us the word now so that he could talk to us in scientific terms? What would that have profited? We still don't have full knowledge, and not only that, but the point of the of life is not to have full knowledge. What happens when we have full knowledge, anyways? See what I mean? That, that who cares if we reach that goal? What is the purpose of reaching that goal? So many times people live without meaning or without purpose, and then they look for it with a to-do list. To-do lists don't equal purpose. That's not the same thing. So God did not expect them to have full knowledge. The same as He still doesn't expect to have full knowledge. He gave. He spoke to people to try and, and bring salvation. Some people listened, some people didn't. He came so that people would be saved. Some people were, some people weren't. Excuse me. He waits to give people opportunity to believe or to disbelieve. Excuse me. So the last thing here, if you go to learn and allow the possibility of you actually being wrong, you, you, you might actually grow. On accident, I oh yeah, absolutely. But you might actually actually grow here. Um, and really, that's the idea, is, is we've gotten too arrogant. We, we can't be told that we're wrong, and, and we can't be taught. We're unteachable. We think that we uh, we just know everything because we can look out for the answer on Google, even though some of the answers that you find on Google are not right. <sighs> Anyways, so uh, here's just a quote from Grudem from his Systematic Theology. Um, I want to say it was written in the 90s. I'm not sure. The inerrancy of scripture means that scripture in the original manuscripts does not affirm anything that is contrary to fact. It always tells the truth. It always tells the truth concerning everything it talks about. It does not mean the Bible tells the U tells um, us every fact there is to know about any subject, but what it does say about any subjects is true. Now, the problem with inerrancy is it's oftentimes misapplied. See, people think the Bible being inerrant means that all the copies could not have had errors, and it had to have been perfectly preserved in every translation exactly the thought that was intended. And that, um, which if you deal with any kind of translations, you know that that's not true. Um, and then they say, okay, um, it can't have any human opinion or anything that is not truth in it. So I guess even Satan himself is telling the truth. So I mean, people misunderstanding what inerrant means and then holding blindly with faith to something that is not actually what the Bible even claimed. The the Bible never claimed that everything that people said or did in it was right and good and true. It never said that. It said this is what God said, and you know then this is what happened, and that's the kind of stuff that it says. So the so Grudem says that um, in his systematic theology that the Bible can be inerrant while still maintaining these things. First off, it still speaks an ordinary language of everyday speech, so you can't hold it to something that you know, poetic language, for instance, just because that the Bible has poetic language, which historically is not always accurate, um, doesn't mean that the Bible is not ac not true or anything. It just means that it's said in maybe poetical ways. Like, for instance, where the Bible says that the trees clapped their hands. Trees don't have hands. We know that. But it's just poetic language. Have you ever read Shakespeare? Um, and then another thing with that is... There are some things that people still say that are not scientifically accurate. Like, I'll give you an example. The sun set. No. The earth revolved. But people don't talk like that. The next thing up there includes loose or free quotations. Once again, not understanding what inerrant means. The last thing there, unusual or un uncommon grammatical constructions are not against inerrancy. Much could be said about that. So the Bible is true and it's trustworthy. That's the that's the main grasp of all this. And what I want you to get is that everybody who's already decided that the Bible is not true has decided that it has contradictions. And everybody who has already decided to believe the Bible has decided that it does not have contradictions. So rather than believing what somebody tells you, why don't you study for the Bible for yourself? And then hold it to the standard that it actually claims, rather than trying to m misprove or, or yeah disprove 
um, your Sunday school teacher from 50 years ago. I see a lot of times something happens like this. Somebody grew up in a church, had a bad experience, like Richard Dawkins. And then they become atheists to get back at those religious people because their bitterness has blinded them. Evidently, uh, somebody claiming to be a Christian when they're not means that God is not real. Who knew? And so now, because they've got this bitterness towards this Sunday school teacher or pastor or whatever, they take it out on God and on the Bible, and so then believe things that just make it sound, I mean, ridiculous. I mean, for instance, if you ever read The God Delusion, oh my goodness. <sighs> but anyways, so I hope that this brought a little bit of clarity, um, unless you just watch this video to say about how people who believe that the Bible doesn't have contradictions are stupid, in which case you probably didn't learn anything.